Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Uh, happy National Signing Day, always an exciting day. Um, when this rolls around, UAB has currently signed 16 players, uh, waiting on a few more. But with that, I'll turn it over to Coach Dilfer to discuss the class. All right, Blazers are significantly better as of right now uh, than we were when the season ended. And I, I do think there's some context here, too. If you remember this time last year, we had coaches living dual lives. Um, we had many coaches that were prepping for bowl games and trying to recruit for the Blazers. Uh, we didn't have a personnel department in place. We hadn't hired an entire staff. Uh, you had a bunch of high school guys rolling into a college program, learning how to recruit. I thought we did a pretty good job year one based on, the, on all the freshmen that played and contributed for us. Um, but this year was a much different uh, situation. Um, over 250 cut-ups were made of high school prospects in this process and portal prospects. Our coaches did an incredible job uh, hitting the road when, when they were allowed to, uh, working the phones, um, establishing relationships with players. And I think the theme to this class would be they're really good players and really good people. You know, they're, our, as we say, ODs, our dudes. Uh, they have the same core values as we have. Uh, they're willing to take on big challenges. They have, they have grit. They have a competitive temperament that we're looking for. They've overcome adversity in their young careers. Uh, and they love football more than what football brings them. And I think that's an important uh, conversation in today's portal NIL world is that these kids love football. They're not looking for football to give them something. They're not entitled. Um, they know that the hard work is ahead of them. And this is an opportunity to get a great degree from a great institution. Uh, and help us win a lot of games in the process. I do think the most important thing with this class, and I will be selfish on this, is one thing I did different. I don't know if other head coaches do this. This is a kind of an NFL methodology, was I took our entire recruiting pool, pool and I identified my top 40 recruits in that. And I was relentless on the top 40 recruit board. Um, you know, position coaches are recruiting their boards, they're recruiting positions, but with the help of a dialed in personnel department, and the coaching staff, I developed a top 40 board. Here's who we signed. Number five, six, eight, 11, 13, 14, 16, 21, 27, 37, 38, 39. I'd say that's a wild victory for Blazer football based on how I looked at these recruits, uh, how they were filtered to me to make my board. Um, if you're wondering one through four, out of those one through four, three are SEC commits as of right now, and one is a uh, another Power Five school. Um, so we feel like we're really successful uh, in this time frame. As Ted mentioned, we're waiting on a couple others I won't be able to talk about um, until they have signed their national letter of intents. But they are big time players, and, and we feel like their their uh, paperwork is coming in any second. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. You got, at least from, from what we could see, you got a late flip today from Eddie Tucson. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the whole process was there, but kind of how big was that and, and, and how important was it, to you, you think, to, to, to add him? And the other thing is, what, what is, is there an art to flipping a kid? <laughs> um, I don't know if there's an art to it. It was relentless engagement. You know, that's kind of one of our philosophies. Um, Eddie is a player that we identified early before anybody else, which is, by the way, a common theme for this personnel department. Uh, hats goes off to them. There are dozens of recruits that we identified first, that we were their first offer, um, that we had a really good beat on, that others jumped in f after, like let our personnel department recruit for them. And uh, But that's that shows that our personnel department is doing best-in-class type work with their prospect identification, um, how, how they go through the whole process of getting a prospect to my desk um, and then to get an offer. So, um, But he was one that we identified really early. Uh, 6'4", 240 pounds, can run, can strike, um, versatile, played safety, played outside, played inside, so has a lot of versatility. A great kid, um, fantastic student. Uh, two other brothers that uh, played college football that are also high academic achievers. Uh, and then we just held on. You know, it was a battle um, till this morning. Um, other big schools jumped in, Minnesota being the biggest. Their, his primary recruiter was their head coach. 
um, because of the loss of a DC. So um, it was a battle, but you got to give it to everybody involved. And, and really, you know, a lot of people stand up here and want to give one person credit. And I don't want to take anything away from WIC or Sioni, but like this was a collective effort now. This was relentless engagement by an entire staff. He loved his trip here. Um, he loved the people he was walking into and the opportunity. I'm actually going to drink this. I usually just have it as a token. Uh, no, I'm not going to drink it then. <laughs> a majority of your class uh, comes from Georgia and Alabama. Was that just a, very much a, a point of emphasis you wanted to make to get these two states that are so close together and have become a hot recruiting bed for you guys? Absolutely. Um, I think it's it's a – you could criticize us for the lack of – now we do have 60 – I think it's 62 of our – current roster from the state of Alabama. I mean, we, we make Alabama definitely a focus above all else. We also lose to two really good schools in the state of Alabama, you know, and then I'd argue that, you know, South Al and Troy are doing a heck of a job too. So uh, this is a hard state to, to say, hey, we're just going to dominate the state of Alabama. That'd be lip service, right, when you have Alabama and Auburn in the state. So we start in Alabama. We go down that road <coughs> relentlessly. Uh, we're doing the same thing in the 25 class, um, and we feel like we did really well in the state of Alabama. But then, because of our ties to Georgia, because of the, the level of high school football there is, um, it makes perfect sense for us to use that as a primary recruiting um, bed as well. So um, we feel really good about our Alabama commits as well as our Georgia commits, and we'll continue to, to recruit both relentlessly. You, you've talked since day one and, and, and today and just every day about the, the wanting to stay with a, with a high school approach, mm -hmm. sort of recruiting. When you're coming off a, a four-win season in your, in your first year, w it, w is it tough at that point to not just try to tear it up and say, hey, especially in this day, you know, day and age of transfer portal and all that kind of stuff, was that tough to, to st still stay with the, the high school approach? I wouldn't even call it a high school approach. I'd call it a both hand. Right, we, we, want, we want to make our roster better with veterans um, and be very active in the portal uh, and in the junior college world. But we, want to, we don't want to do it this, and sacrifice the ability to get a really good high school player and person on our roster. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And we're still doing it. Like, this is just one day. Like, this is a battle till February 7th. Um, and I think it's a battle in the portal till school starts. So um, we will continue to pursue some guys in the portal um, that, feel, that we feel make us better uh, next year, but not at the sacrifice of getting a really good high school prospect. You know, and I'd put Tylen in that list. You know, this is a kid we identified late. We think he's a difference maker type hybrid linebacker safety. Um, originally, that spot was going to be for a veteran, but we didn't want to wait on a veteran uh, and sacrifice losing a kid that we feel can be a, just a dynamic uh, defensive player for us, and maybe as soon as next year, but most likely in the future. Much like last year, uh, you hit the trenches real hard. Uh, obviously, you look at the season, uh, you know, a lot of work needed to be down there. Uh, just, you know, what was the process of going through there, as well as, uh, you know, talking about some of these, uh, uh, the portal guys you got in that bring an instant uh, experience. So, point of emphasis, obviously, was both lines of scrimmage play. It was last year and was this year. I felt like we walked into um, a group, and I, I, again, Bill and BV and I see line of scrimmage play differently, and that's fine. We're not, we're not one's not right, and one's not wrong. It's just different. So we felt like we had to dramatically change both lines of scrimmage. Uh, if you look at that now in a two-year cycle, and we're not quite done yet, but it, it, close to a two-year cycle, we've we've dramatically changed line of scrimmage play. Um, defensive line will start there. Um, getting Miles, getting Chris. Oh, I gotta make sure I can say that one. Sorry. <clears throat> yep, good. <laughs> getting Miles and getting Chris uh, on the defensive line were huge. We're waiting on one more. That's one I can't talk about uh, that we think will um, just continue to add to a really good young group. Um, those guys that played last year, I mean, you saw them play last year, and, and they're going to be key points to our line of scrimmage play on defensive next year. Um, these are big time prospects. Uh, and then our offensive line, um, getting Barry and, and uh, Jaden. Uh, are massive additions at the high school level, both massive humans that can move. Uh, both have played uh, a lot of high school football, both have really good tape, um, and both have really high ceilings. Um, good kids, 
um, that we believe in their work ethic, we believe in their ability to improve and to compete at this level. And then, like you said, with the portal, I think that's probably where the home runs are, getting uh, John Darius and DJ. Um, now you're, you're looking at two guys that have, again, super have length for one. You know, I think one of the big things that I'm a snob on on the offensive front is having length there. Um, these are two humans with massive arms um, that have the have NFL length traits. Um, one played, in, you know, played at a very high level in the SEC, and <clears throat> the other one has played a lot of football at a lower level, but has dominated that level. So, um, we're we feel like we're much better today on the defense and offensive line than we were before recruiting started. Thank you. With the Armani Goodwin adding, adding a, you know, a high-profile guy, especially a local high-profile guy that played SEC to, you know, at a high level, kind of how big was, uh, you know, how big was it to, to add him to this? Massive. Um, I think Armani's a guy that everybody's very familiar with. It's also getting him back into his home state, um, and uh, he's a guy that has dynamic qualities uh, that have been proven in SEC football. You know, he went to LSU, competed at a high level, unfortunately got injured. Um, new coaching staff changed, people coming in, kind of got lost on the depth chart. But his tape in the SEC is elite. I think he's an NFL quality back. Uh, I think he pairs perfectly t also with the backs we have coming back. Uh, Isaiah's coming off his injury, but he's a, Isaiah is a powerful, versatile back. Um, Lee proved to play at a high level at the end of the year. Again, another 210 pound more. I would call him a power um, back as well. Uh, Armani's a kid that can play with power, can play with speed, is dangerous out of the backfield. He kind of is what you saw with Skull, right? And you saw how that mixture works really well. Um, and he, he complements what we want to do offensively very well. You said you got a couple more guys today. Uh, will there still be some more guys coming in the next couple months going into yeah. February, Sunday? Yeah, we will still be very active in recruiting. Um, we, uh, we, we, like I said, I'm being very honest about that. We're still going to be very active in the portal. Um, those kids, you know, they're kind of out there until they enter school. So, um, the, you know, these narratives are funny because they all jump in. Everybody goes, holy crap, there's 3,000 kids in the portal. And then the narrative today becomes, yeah, but here's where they're going. You know, what you're not hearing is there's still really good football players out there in the portal that haven't committed anywhere. So uh, we're going to be active in trying to recruit them. We have a handful of spots that we feel um, are areas of need for competition um, or for potential starters that we'll, we'll approach in the portal there. And then we have that whole month of January to continue to recruit the high school landscape. And there's a lot of players that weren't, that didn't panic. You know, and I'd say that's kind of the, the deal with this December 20th signing period is like some are forced by other schools and they panic and they, they jump and sign today. But there's a lot of other ones that deal with, deal with this in a more uh, mature way and they wait till the, the 7th to sign and, and uh, we'll continue to recruit those guys. Trent, what does it say about the fact that you got a couple of SEC guys instead of them just staying in the SEC or maybe Big Ten or somewhere like that, but they come to UAB, what does it say about what you guys were able to do to get those kind of guys? Well, I think uh, there's an Alabama connection, obviously, right? I think we're, we've said this since day one. I think a lot of people want to come back to their home state, come back to this great city. You know, I think uh, between John Darius and Armani, those are two Birmingham kids. You know, they want to be back in a city that they love um, that was good to them. So that's a draw. It probably has nothing to do with me or <laughs> our staff. And then the second thing is they see opportunity. You know, I think a lot of these kids go chase the Power Five and the, the, the logo glitz and glamour, and they realize when they get there that it's not all it's made out to be. Um, and they really, like I said earlier, they just love football, right? And I think what the SEC and the Power Fives have to offer you is football and a bunch of other stuff. And kids fall in love with the other stuff. And that's okay. Like, I wish I had all that other stuff too. Um, but... There comes a point in time when you're playing football, you have to decide, do I love this other stuff? Do I love laying down in my locker bed more than I love carrying the ball on a Saturday? Do I love a buffet lunch of lobster and all I can eat stuff? Or do I love catching balls on Saturday? Right? Do I love whatever it is? Or do I love moving people with line of scrimmage on Saturday? And I think we're looking for kids that love to do things on Saturday.
and I think both of these SEC um, transfers feel that way. <clears throat> they tasted the other stuff. The other stuff didn't quench their thirst, and now they want to they want to be dynamic playmakers on Saturday. So um, they have that opportunity here. I think that you look at you know I think some of the best portal moves in the past couple years have been FCS kids that have dominated that level of com competition and now want to test themselves against a higher level of competition. Again, what do they love? They love football. They love challenging themselves, right? They didn't have the other stuff. They're going somewhere that doesn't have all the other stuff. Why? Because they love football and they love the opportunity to compete at a higher level on Saturday. And that's, that's what we're looking for. At the end of the day, the number one conversation goes on in that war room when it comes down to are we going to sign this kid or are we not going to sign this kid is I want to know when they wake up in the morning is the hair on their arms stand up because they get the chance to play football or is it some other reason? If it's some other reason, they're probably not fit for how we're going to be built from here on out. With as many freshmen as y'all played last year, did that make it uh, a little bit easier to uh, you know recruit some of these high school kids with the opportunity to you know come in and you work? You'll have opportunity just mm -hmm. like these guys did last year. Yeah, I think it was a big... Uh, a big thing that we were told by the freshman kids was you've proven it. Everybody else talks about it. You actually did it. You know, like a lot of people talk about a lot of things in recruiting and the families that I think make good decisions are the ones that have evidence of what the staff is talking about. They have video evidence of those things they have. And so when we said we played 20, I think it's 24 freshmen or redshirt freshmen last year, um, we could show them video of it. They can see it. Like, we're not just, it's not lip service. If you're one of the better players, Coach Dilbert doesn't see age. He sees production. Um, he sees your leadership qualities. He sees your ability to help us win football games. And, you know, don't forget, we started a 17 year old for half the season. So, and I go back to my high school experience. I started an eighth grader in the state championship game. He graded out better than all the seniors. So, if you can do it, you can do it. With, with Adrian Posse. Just kind of what, uh, you know, as a quarterback guy, so, so what, what's your evaluation to him and what does he, he do well and that type of thing? Massively talented. Like in my elite 11 years, he would have been called one of those power twitch guys, like massively high horsepower. Um, big kid, big, thick, jointed, athletic kid, um, tons of arm talent, great personality, natural leadership skills. Um, tough as nails like had a had some tough high school experiences with injuries and kids leaving a school where he had you know me blocking for him which would not be a pretty thing and and uh, he just gun barrel toughness stood in there and took a beating uh, has the athletic movement ability to escape rush um, really smart kid you know he hasn't been challenged a lot in his high school uh, game in a, from a mental standpoint but uh as we spend time with him, a kid that, that loves the X's and O's, loves to learn. Um, so we feel like his future is very, very bright. And was very, very coveted early in recruiting, like had all the big ones. One, one other thing we talk about in, in this day is the guys coming in. But in, you know, again, in this day with the portal and, and you know, so many guys leaving programs, it is do you often do as much recruiting to keep guys in your programs as, as, as you do uh, as, as you do you know, regular recruiting? And is that something that you do year round too, not just have to do during this period? Yeah, I think I said this last year. I, I look at recru recruiting as connections, right? I, I think you, if you make deep connections with players and families, that that is recruiting. So. There was, there was a conversation in this building late in the year, like, hey, we really got to recruit our kids. I'm like, well, no, that's been going on. Like, we have deep connections with our kids. Our kids trust us. They trust us to tell them the truth. Even the ones that have entered have all entered with, hey, coach, you've done been nothing but honest with me. You know, I may not agree with some of your decisions and all that, and that's fine, but you've been honest and feel like I don't want you to feel like I'm leaving on bad terms. Um, so... I think the reason we've been able to hold on to the majority of players that would probably had portal opportunities that we wanted to keep is because they trust our end of the year evaluations. They trust um, when they sit with me in that last week before they went home, they trust with my vision for them and um, the plan for how they're going to reach their potential. Um, they're not afraid of competition. Why? Because they love football. 
right? Like a lot of our kids that we didn't want to jump haven't jumped because they truly love football more than what the lures out there of what the other stuff that football can bring them. Um, they just love an environment where they come in every day and they're treated well and they're they're spoken to well, they're loved, and they get uh, a level of football that although the product on the field wasn't great, they know the product in the building is getting us to greatness. Any other questions? All right, appreciate you guys. Thank you. Those guys didn't come through yet. Uh, yeah. I can't wait to talk about them. <laughs>